Hi, I'm Peter Panagor. Welcome, and I want to say hi to everybody who's here this morning and everybody who's going to be watching in the future. Yogi, Masters of Divinity degree from the Ivy League and renegade, renegade liberal clergy, a transcendental free thinker, near death and oneness experiencer, mystic just like you, and soul lover because I am infinitely loved. Welcome to my channel where we seek the divine in multiple disciplines, especially in the mystical Jesus, sharing ancient and modern wisdom and always leaning into love. God is love, and maybe better called my beloved with a capital B. My beloved, my beloved, my beloved. That makes a beautiful prayer chant. Join us today as we explore reincarnation and Christianity, what I learned when dead. We begin each week with a brief time of centering together. And no matter where you are on earth or when you're watching this live or later, the timeless energy of the radiant beloved can and does flow between us, magnify among us where two or more are gathered, I am there, deepens our meditation and our prayer time. You can feel it for yourself. You don't need to take my word for it. It's a group experience. Let's begin as we usually do with three ohms out loud and then a minute or three of silent centering prayer. When we practice together, we strengthen each other. To learn a simple meditation practice, centering prayer, check out the links in the descriptions below. Oh, and if you have any favorite subjects or questions or Bible verses or some mystical thing <laughs> that you want me to cover, drop me a note in the comments or send me an email. I read them all. So I'm going to say hi to the folks I didn't say hi to yet. I think... Wendy and Ellen and Colleen and Coralie, Carmen and Margie, Maggie and Mel G. Thanks for being here this morning, everybody. All right, so let's spend a moment and um, raise our energy, raise our prana, bring it right up. I squeeze my butt in tight. I pull my stomach in when I'm chanting. I fill my lungs. I fill my belly. I breathe out, vibrating in my chest. I'm looking at my own chest in the camera on the screen. I vibrate in my own chest. I vibrate in my throat. I bring the whole mm, right up to my third eye, the, the brow of my forehead. Let's do this three times energetically. Calm down and drop into our quiet, centering prayer, contemplative meditation personal chant that we then share the energy between us. You ready? Okay, here we go.
you know, it's your energy and the divine energy that makes my Sunday mornings as peaceful and as beautiful as they always are. Thank you for coming today bringing your, and bringing your soul with you. Today, reincarnation and Christianity, what I learned when I was dead. For starters, let's go right to the hardest and clearest biblical statement. And the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27, look it up, chapter 9, verse 27, it outright rejects reincarnation. Quote, just as man's one death leads to judgment. Can't get clearer than that. One death attributed to Paul. Let's touch on judgment first, just because we're here. Now, I went through judgment when I died, and I'll be exploring more about judgment in the weeks to come. But for now, know this. God didn't judge me. I judged myself in comparison to infinite purity, beauty, goodness, and love, and found myself guilty. Learn more about this in either of my more recent videos. I learned about forgiveness going through hell and about my trip to hell, what it is. Links below. Today, we're going to be talking about repeated and multiple births in mortal form. You know, I love Paul of Tarsus. I didn't always love Paul of Tarsus because he is an anti-feminist. He's misogynistic. He's trouble in lots of ways. He's a con he's, contextually speaking, he was a man of his time. And that's important to remember. He's a man of his time. But I love Paul of Tarsus. I learned to love him when I finally figured out that he was a mystic who famously experienced that light bolt flash thing that knocked him off his ass, his donkey on the side of the road while riding to Damascus, that famous story. He saw, felt, and understood the light himself, itself, Jesus' self. And Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And at that moment, Saul his old name, became Paul, the born-again, renamed man we know and love. Being born again in this life is a super common experience to near-death experiencers and to anyone who's had a mystical experience of any kind that has some sort of height to it. High-intensity mystical experiences like that one, and like I said, near-death experiences, they change a person. Paul changed his name to show everybody that he had changed as a person on the interior. And no one who goes through such an intensity comes out of it the same person. You can't. Paul was a mystical genius. And I believe him whenever he is speaking directly out of his mystical experience, out of his noetic knowledge, his wisdom. But. But whenever he strays into theology, which is always speculation, well, nope, women should be quiet in church. Mm, nope, women should not wear jewelry. Mm, nope. Whenever he strays into theology, he's, a, he's being a product of his time. And the thing is this, I know what I saw he must not have seen because it's not recorded in his mystical writings. Paul was wrong about reincarnation. There, I've said it. Oh my gosh, I've said it. Paul was wrong about reincarnation. I saw what God showed me. I didn't choose it. I saw what God showed me about myself and the divine God in everything I saw when I was dead was self-evidently true and the purity with a capital P and the true with a capital T, self-evidently true and pure. Now, you can believe me or not. It doesn't matter to me because you're going to see for yourself when your time comes. That's fine. You know, literalist Christians and even many liberal Christians, 
may call me out as Satan's tool. Because I'm saying, what I'm saying is unbiblical in their measurement, in their judgment. I mean, it says so in the book, right? I kept this part of me, this understanding of reincarnation, understandably hidden when I was a preacher man because I wanted to keep my job. I had a family to raise. I had kids. I had a wife and a parsonage. And, and I loved my work, much of it anyway, not all of it, but much of it, serving people, bringing love, doing the difficult and troublesome jobs that nobody else would do. I loved that stuff. And I could argue the point using some clever logic and proof texting, like some say John the Baptist is Elijah in the Gospels. Some say John is Elijah in the Gospels, I repeat. Returned again as a new person. John is Elijah, and Elijah came back in, in, in John as a new person. I could argue those proof texts, but why bother? I'm not really a proof texting kind of guy. Uh, those who troll me already claim that I did not go to heaven when I died by various and selective proof texting, such as uh, even the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. That's the famous one. There are others. But listen, I, I saw what I was shown. I, I, I was shown, I didn't like go looking for it, and understood the truth of it with a capital T. I can't help that. I think Paul was wrong about the one life to live thing. I mean, it's made it all the way into music. We have one life to live. I think there was even a, there wasn't, wasn't there a soap opera in the United States, you know, 20 years ago, one life to live? To be sure, Christianity has never accepted reincarnation as a whole. Maybe segments of it has, but as a whole, mm-mm. And I don't think they're going to now. And Jesus said to the man on the cross beside him, as he was hanging there on his death day, he said to the man beside him on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. I mean, that just goes against a lot of Christian thinking that you have to wait till the end times in order to get to heaven. That's what the whole bury you and not burn you thing is, having to do with uh, incineration of the human body. Because you need your body, because you're going to need your body, because you're not going to go right to heaven. You're going to have to have your body, going to wait for that. Well, that's not what Jesus said on the cross. You'll be with me in paradise today. And then we know that he came back, like he came back. Near-death experiences by the tens of millions testify that paradise is real. Paradise is your birthplace. It's your home. And you live there now, but you can't see it from here. Not very well, anyway, with the 70,000 veils in between. Maybe a glimpse is what we get down here underneath that weight of veils, but the veils are light in weight and can lift and a breeze, and do, letting the truth flash within us. And a paradise is your home, and Paul was right about that. But, you know, I, I don't live in my hometown. I'm from there. And maybe I go back there, but then I leave again. And I, I believed, as I died on the ice cliff that night, that I had one life to live, and here I am before you, living my third life, having died twice and returned to this one body. Three lives in one body. Basically three people in one body. I changed each time. You can't go through a mystical experience of such intensity and not come back a new person. Maybe I should have changed my name to, well, I don't know, I leave that up to you. Many NDEers have been reborn more than me you know, some four, five, eight, ten times. Now, what of previous lifetimes? I, I saw, I was shown my everlasting soul. 
I was, I saw my everlasting soul from the inside of it, from the elong, from the elongation of my eternal everlasting self from the inside of my soul while simultaneously being above it and viewing it from above and seeing this everlastingness of my soul life. I was enormous in length and breadth in being and beauty. The revealer, capital R, the revealer showed me this. And I was simultaneously inside my everlasting high energy nature, that wave form of my soul that began and begins as a single photon emanation metaphor of light from the infinite light. I was inside it and above it. I was one yet separate and limited. I was one with the light and yet separate and limited, a tiny creature in the face of the eternal creator. The all-powerful principle showed me my place as my true and teeny tiny self in comparison to the ultimate infinite eternal nature, but I was humongous compared to me, Peter. And then I was shown that everlasting length of my consciousness, and I was that consciousness. I was me. I, I'm not Peter. I know that sounds crazy to some folks, but I am not Peter. I live in Peter. I am my everlasting soul. Without mortal constraint, I saw myself. The length of my soul life was measured in eons. And. I could see evidence of other lives lived. I've said this before here. Now, were those lives simultaneous? I was in timelessness. So they seemed to be simultaneous to me, but they were also in time. And I saw three or five or more. It's hard to see from this side of, of my other lives beaming out of my soul. And they were teeny, okay, compared to the um, enormous nature of myself. They were beaming out of my soul into other times and other places and other persons other than Peter. And maybe they were all at the same time, maybe the simultaneous, or maybe they're in sequence. It's hard to tell from there when I, where I was in death. And it's certainly hard to tell from here inside my brain because my vision on this side over here to over there is now obscured by my limitations of this incarnation. From here, I don't know how many other lives I lived. Many. But, and I can't see them. And I, I just know that I saw them. And they've informed everything I've done ever since. So for me, reincarnation is real, no matter what Paul says, no matter what the Bible says. And I, I could go and I could explore my past lives and past life regression, which a lot of people do, and many do it, and that's fine, and it's good for them, and it's helpful to them. But as for me, I learned that not one of my incarnations was me. I am not my body. I am not any bodies that I ever lived in. I am my eternal nature, my higher self. I am not any of those past lives I lived. I am my soul, my consciousness, goodness, higher self, Atman, light from light, and anything else is less, less than, and too small. Upon my death, I was judged by myself in the presence of love and entered what could be described as a Christ-like paradise, the oneness of being. Now, you can believe me or not. It doesn't really matter much to me. I know where I'm from. I've lived my life accordingly, and I know to whom I belong and to where I'm going. It's such freedom, my friends. It's such freedom. Now, I've been there twice this life round. And I can say this for sure. My ignorance far exceeds my wisdom. And this is true for every mystic, Paul included. 
No mystical experiencer ever knows in full. It's impossible. We can only know in part, including all NDEers. Only the divine knows the fullness of itself. Only the divine is fullness of knowledge. So, my friends, Paul included, stay humble in the face of the infinite who knows all and is all. And I know this one bit more. Human brains and bodies are too small to contain the magnitude of the amplitude of the frequency of the Almighty. I'm just too little. And I can't prove it, but I think, I know, dear Paul, was wrong about reincarnation, which of course throws the redemptive theology of Christianity into some disarray. There are implications to this, which if you're a believing Christian or you were a believing Christian, I'm sure that you can imagine for yourself. The thing is, I love Jesus, but as an NDEer who knows that I am known by the knower, I am no believer. All of my beliefs were erased from me. Once I was touched by the knowledge of the presence of the divine, it makes it tons easier to peer through the Bible and see what's human and what isn't. Now, my friends, may the peace not of this world promised by Jesus, my teacher, be with all of us. The beloved loves us all as we are. No exceptions, no exclusions. Everyone is love. Everyone is loved. Aim your heart at the oneness of being, not at the earth, and find your way home. Evolution doesn't end here on earth. We continue to evolve as souls and grow in the fullness of light itself. So peace be with you. Peace be with you. That's all I got to say this morning, my friends. So if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and remember your gifts of support. And I thank you very much, Kristen. And I saw another one come through, whoever that was. I appreciate that. Your gifts of support keep this content coming to you and to others right here for free. Check out my website, peterpanagor.love for ways to donate as well as uh, for upcoming speaking engagements and workshops that you might be interested in attending. And I got to put that into the website soon. Uh, join us live on Zoom at the top of the next hour for our weekly wisdom conversation and community at Mystic Tea Salon. Find and the, find the link and the password. Uh, did I not put it down below? I really meant to put it down below. I might take a second. Oh, shoot. Find it at, at, at uh, peterpanagor.love under programs. I really meant to put it in the, in the description, but I forgot. Oh, well. Uh, and in the comments, in the comments, please tell me your thoughts about reincarnation or maybe what you've seen of your past lives or, or why you think it's important. Just let us know. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go over to the chat and see what's going on. I want to say thank you to Metal Lark and to Capital. Thank you, everybody. To Kim. Um, thanks. And I'll see if I can um, like the video. Thanks for liking the video, all you people. Thank you, Nancy. Let's see. Again, any comments or questions? Wonderful message. Thanks, Beth. Uh, thank you. See you in the salon. See you, Catherine, in the salon. Peace be with you. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you. How impactful is belief in NDE? Asks Cindy. Uh, 
experiences range widely. My personal experience had me thrown into a rolling field of consciousness. I was that consciousness. I, I think that our belief, I think that God is compassionate. I know, no, let me, let me rephrase that. God is compassion. And as compassion, God reaches to us where we are, not where we're not. And so when, I think this is what happens in our NDEs. I think our NDEs are reflective of us, like you say. I think our belief systems create our capacity for experience, the experience we have on the other side. So some people get thrown into wonderful fields and see themselves as the consciousness that way, and other people get tossed into the nothingness of all being. It depends on who you are and where you're at. Uh, some people who've never met Jesus, some meet Jesus. Some people who've never seen an angel before see an angel. People who are atheists. So I think that there's some impact of our belief systems, but I don't think it's total. But one thing I am sure of is that the divine, the great compassionate, speaks to us in ways that we can hear and the way that we can understand. Because no matter what's going on in a near-death experience, even though you're risen above and you are in heaven, God is still reaching down from the, from the unity, reaching down to us, filtering is self, itself, themselves, so that we can understand our experience. We're still limited in nature when we're dead unless you fall into the unitive state, then you're in the unitive state and then you're in the divine. So I think that, that all the variety of mystical experiences that are, that are near death experiences as a result of what we need to hear. So you ever think about the people who go to hell and don't get out of hell? They go to a near death experience, they go into hell and then they come back to this life and what they live in this life is as a result of their experience in hell and their lives change. So I think also the experience that we have in our near-death experiences are not only custom made for us to understand when we're dead, I think they're custom made for us bespoke to give us messages to use in this life, to change the direction of the life that we're living. That's what happened to Paul in Damascus, on the road to Damascus. Oh, he made a complete 180 headed in a different direction because of that experience, because of what he saw on the other side. So it's not only about what we see on the other side when we're there, it's about what that means to us and how to live our lives on this side once we come back. All right. Thank you, Catherine. What do we have here? I should take off my glasses. Definitely feel that I have past lives. They show up as abilities and interests in this life. I believe we have many lives as a way to learn to love more fully. Amen to that, Catherine. Reincarnation is real. Oh, I lost that one. That one went up too, uh, too fast. I believe people who, I'm gonna, maybe I can lean in, maybe I can find a compromise here. There we go. Um, I believe in it. I believe people who do not learn certain lessons come back here in that experience it's possible or to help folks in that experience like abuse and oppression yeah could be since life is eternal we don't die but remanifest in new containers life goes on and on that's the one thing i love about judaism you know a bunch of my jewish friends think i'm jewish because one of the things is that you know, life is a continuation. They don't, the Torah doesn't speak about an afterlife. If anything, it talks about a continuation of life, a doorway, a doorway into a continuation of life. Same thing is true for Native American cultures that I've been exposed to in their spirituality. It's a journeying on. They journey on to the next world. There's no end. Uh, raised by evangelical missionaries, I didn't believe in reincarnation, but when I heard more about it, I didn't want to believe in its possibility. I wanted to go straight up 
Well, you know, Margie, there's no reason why you can't go straight up. I, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that everybody has to reincarnate. I did not see that. I do not know that. Um, maybe some folk do go directly to heaven, you know, pass, go, and don't go to jail. <laughs> On the monopoly. That's what I'm talking about, monopoly. So, um, but I, you know, that's above my pay grade. So maybe, maybe some folks just go directly there. But that wasn't my experience. That's not what I saw. I read from Aldix Huxley that the Eastern view of incarnation is quite similar to the idea of purgatory in Christianity. Yeah, that could be. Um, I can see the similarity. The purgatory, the hell I went through is kind of purgatory like too divine fire of purgative love, as Catherine of Siena called it. Love is what matters. Jesus is love. God is love. We are as we love. We strive toward love. Reincarnation gives us the opportunity to go further, I think, said Kim. Yeah, what matters most is not, it's really not what you believe, it's what you do. Do you live a life of love and compassion and not believe in Jesus? Or do you live a life of hatred and anger and believe in Jesus? Who's better off spiritually? Gotta, gotta wonder. Um, God only knows how we come back. God only knows how we come back. That's the thing. It's, it's all still above my pay grade. I still really don't know all of it. I can't. It's not possible. I just happen to think Paul is wrong. That's all. I love incarnations. Imagine reincarnations are awesome too. I love carnations. I've had your reincarnations are awesome too. Are you being funny? That's funny. That's very funny. Um, that's funny. Um, let's see what else we have. I, I'm open to that, Belinda. Uh, healing, exactly, says Brooke. Primary feather. Uh, let's see, where are we? Or I suppose some people can come back and beat themselves up. Supposedly some people in heaven are at a lower level. They may have work to do too. I suppose so. You know, I, I really don't know all the answers. I, I just don't. Like I said, my ignorance is greater than my knowledge. And and maybe there are people in heaven who are beating themselves up. I, I didn't see that. I don't know. I have a hard time thinking about that though, because of the of the higher vibrational level because of the purity of being that's there, because there's no mortality there, because I wasn't my Peter there. Maybe, I don't know. I suppose some people can come back. Oh yeah, I read that one. Uh, good evening, Peter and everyone from India. Namaste. Namaste, brother, over there in India. Heather Asha, thanks for coming today. Uh, must be midnight over there, I guess, or after midnight. Uh, love to you all. Pure consciousness, love, unity, oneness of purpose. Open up to it all. Stay in the now. Stay in the now, my friends. Okay, okay. Um, thanks, everybody, for the super chats you gave me this morning. That's very generous of you. I appreciate it. I'm really here because of you guys, and I'm trying to make this as a as welcoming as possible and reaching as many people as I can. And like I said, if you have a favorite biblical passages you want me to think about or talk about or other subjects that you want to bring up, please let me know in the comments. Let me know by email. Uh, PeterPanagor.love. Pure consciousness, love and unity, open. I, I just read that one. What then is an old soul? Is that a thing? Well, you know, in timelessness, there is no age. I think an old soul is a human perspective of a soul that has been reincarnated many times. But from the soul's perspective, I, I saw that I had everlasting nature and that I had been created eons and eons ago in a measurement of time. But was I old? Not in comparison to infinity. And that's my reference point. Everything about my life is in reference to infinity, to the oneness of being, to the purity of all. So am I an old soul? Maybe some humans will think so, but from where I stand and 
at the, at, at the, in the throne room, at the touch in the hem of the robe of the divine in the throne room, you know, stealing that from, I think it's Isaiah. Um, I think it's Isaiah. It could be Ezekiel. I have to look that up, but still in that, that image anyway, um, I am young in comparison, but I do think that there are people who've been here again and again and again, and maybe, maybe I've been in this world again and again and again. I can't even tell you whether I was on earth or even in this universe. I, I just can't see it from here. But it doesn't really matter to me. Anyone who's talking about, it's a thing. All right, let me, let me clarify this. Old soul, young soul, doesn't really matter. What really matters is whether you're aiming your heart at the divine, if you're aiming your life at heaven, if you're seeking heaven above all things, old soul, young soul, the result is the same, an accumulation of light inside you. And maybe the old soul has the advantage over the young soul, but both are exactly the same from a divine perspective. Both are the divine emanating itself, projecting itself into the world, creating the world, and seeing through that soul. That's my take on that. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you very much. Leaning in here to read again. I don't know what to think about reincarnation until I read the gospel according to spiritualism by Alan Kardec. And it definitely changed my mind. Today helped a lot too. Super duper. Thanks, Joe, for saying so. I'll have to look up that book. I don't know it. Um, the Catholic Church talks about the promises of Christ. I had an intuition that it's the Sermon on the Mount. It blew the priest's mind. He was speechless. Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount. That Why that isn't the center of the church life, I really don't know. The Sermon on the Mount is like the most beautiful thing there is in the Bible, other than you know, God is love, basically. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why. Uh, uh, those are blessed are the poor in spirit. What's what's it? What is to be poor in spirit? Uh, I could talk about that. Um, maybe I should do it. Maybe I should do a, a series on the Sermon on the Mount. Let me know if you want that. Uh, I, I I should have probably done that a while ago. But let me know if you want that. I'm sure you blew that priest's mind. I'm an eternally young soul, like a child. Blinda, me too. You and me both. You, did you ever read the book or come across the book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind? I I'm always approaching my spirituality as if I am a student, as if I am a beginner. Because when I approach it as a beginner, I'm a lot more open to what the divine, what God has in store for me, for gifts that want to be given to me. So, yeah. I'm totally interested in facing my spirituality as a beginning, as a, as a child. Blessed are the children. Blessed are the children because they see the divine in innocence. And that's the goal of spirituality is to become innocent in perspective, to see the divine like a child without preconception, without thoughts about what it's supposed to be. Um, but it, there is no time. It's all happening in a moment. Well, there is time in the universe. I mean, we can measure it, but it is, it is time is there's no absolute time because we understand how gravity works. Um, and there's this thing called gravitational lensing. It's how we see behind galaxies. It's because it, time and space bends. So time is definitely not absolute, not even in this universe. Uh, but in heaven, there, all time exists and no time exists. It's timelessness. And so when in our spiritual lives, in our, if you want to access the divine in the here and now, that's where you find it. God is always now. It's always now. It's always now. Not later, not before, not next week. Right here, right now is where we tap into the divine because God's not in time. God creates time, but God is not in time. I mean, God exists inside of time for time to exist, but mm, just a teeny tiny bit of the divine fits inside of time in order to make it happen and be and real. But the divine itself, ooh, way outside of time, above time, beyond time. So to penetrate that, we have to touch the eternal now. 
compelling evidence of reincarnation for almost 40 years, Ian Stevenson. Oh, I know Ian. What a great guy. What a great guy, New Ian, at the University of, University of Virginia, investigated cases of thousands of children worldwide who remembered their past lives. That research continues in Ian Stevenson, University of Virginia. What a guy. One of the founders of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. What a guy. Yeah, there's the, the problem with Christian perspective on reincarnation is that they, which is often true about science in general, is that if it, they reject it, if it doesn't agree with the Bible. So they reject scientific research. If it doesn't agree with the Bible, evolution, creation, all that stuff, which is why there are so many people who are anti-science, you know, I'm glad for Ian's work and I'm glad you brought that up. I'd forgotten about Ian's work. Um, compelling thanks a lot jim very nice of you to do that uh let's yes please sermon on the mount okay yes sermon on the mount yes sermon on the mount <laughs> we got three votes for that and uh so what i'm gonna do is because i came prepared today i've got a pencil and i have paper and i'm gonna make a note sermon on the mount because in my world, my ADH world, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I am definitely ADHD. See, ADHD. Um, if I don't write it down, it just doesn't exist. It's the way my head works. Um, strength, courage, wisdom, compassion, and humility. Strength, courage, wisdom, compassion, and humility are gifts of the Spirit of God. That's true. You dive into heaven inside yourself. You find that you awaken to the now, now. What you find is strength, courage, wisdom, compassion, and humility. Those are the gifts of the spirit. It's beautifully said. Thank you very much, Margie. Yes, Peter, exactly. Thanks, Belinda. Yes, Sermon on the Mount. Oh, we got four from Avatar. A little Boston accent there for you. I had my, my Boston accent trained out of me in order to speak very articulately for radio, preaching, and television. But wicked. I'm wicked, Peter. Um, Ken says, Peter, Peter, in your NDE, could you follow the waveform of yourself back to your creation form of God? Yeah. You're the first person who's ever said that to me, Ken. That's exactly what happened. I didn't, no, I didn't follow my waveform back to the creation the moment of God. I was carried. I didn't like, oh, look over there. I think I'll go that way. But definitely I, 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 I was followed. I, I was following. I was carried to follow my waveform back to the origin of my being. That's exactly what happened to me. I saw my, the origin of my created self. The very moment of my, the moment, the thing about the, the elongation of the soul, I talk about the eternal nature, the everlasting nature of my soul being this really eons long thing, but it's also in timelessness. So even though I traveled all the way figuratively back to the origin of my soul self, it was in the now. It was always there being created in that moment, even though even though I traveled this far distance to get there, it's always paradox with God. You know, it's a paradox. Whenever there's a paradox, there are three opinions. Um, that's an old, that's an old rabbi saying, whenever there are three or two rabbis, there are three opinions, but I'm going to go with whenever there's a paradox, there are three opinions. Um, what about, what is life about? You think a John Doe, I think life is about love. I think life is about loving. I think our job is to love the best we can. And, and it's not really about belief. It's not about knowledge. It's about the divine seeing itself in all of the world. And it's not just our life, okay? It's chickadees and rabbits, and bunnies and, and snakes and whales, and bacteria and viruses and trees and rocks and rivers. All of this is the divine self here, including the moon and the super gigantic, massive black hole, the center of our galaxy. All of this is the divine reaching out, sensing itself. 
as created, as a created thing. The uncreated, the unmanifested manifesting, the uncreated creating. But I think on a human scale, it's a, into this world as we can. To treat each other humanely, to treat each other with kindness and compassion. That's what I think it's about. That's what my experience is. Maybe reincarnate happening during our life here, going reinvention and rebirth during this physical life through change. Well, Karen, yeah, I think that we do. I think we, we as we change, I mean, I definitely have, I've had two, in, you know, I, I was born, one. I had uh, two near-death experiences. That's three incarnations in this one lifetime. And I think, yes, Karen, I think spirituality does that. My friend, Brooke, my eldest has long known things about cultures far removed from anything he has ever lived in this incarnation. It's been fun to hold space for and lovingly witness as I know reincarnation is real. Wah, yeah, reincarnation is real. And children, little children, they haven't forgotten yet. Yeah, that's for sure. You want me to do Boston, huh? Well, so I'm the only person in my family who doesn't who who doesn't talk Boston anymore, because you know, school, radio, that stuff. It's wicked cool. Um, I, I'll do a little Boston as we go along. I think once I read that Pat about reincarnation were removed from the Bible. Is that correct? I think I have read that, but I won't, I won't be able to point you to any direction or any direct evidence of that. I have read that that was true, but I do not know of any, any evidence of that. And evidence is where it's at with scholarship. No evidence? Eh, we don't know. Um, but if I come across them, I'm, I'm, I'm doing one of those great courses, you know, the great courses. I'm doing a great course on uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls right now. And if I come across that information and then during this course, I'll let you know. Yeah, so I'm continuing to educate myself. I'm just going to let you guys know that even though I think that the only way to know the divine is in the divine presence itself, which is what meditation and Kriya Yoga and Centering Prayer and all this stuff is all about. I still continue to read stuff and educate myself because there's a lot to know because I am basically ignorant. Um, all right, so compelled to follow. Uh, yes, I don't believe in hell. You don't have to believe in hell, Nicola. I doesn't, you know, I went through a hell of my own making. Uh, does everybody get one like that? Probably not. Probably not. I did. You know, it's not an absolute thing. It's not an absolute thing. If you want to know about my, my hell trip, I got a video on it. Um, I don't ask anybody to believe anything that I say because I know that it's subjective. And I also know that I can't really tell you what I saw when I was dead because I didn't have a body. And you're going to find out for yourself. So believe in it, don't believe in it, doesn't really matter a whole lot. Um, I, I've got about 11 minutes here before not uh, not church ends well sooner than that because uh mystic tea salon is coming and if you want to attend mystic tea salon and have a wisdom conversation and i mean conversation where everybody has equal voice everybody gets a chance to talk um and bring wisdom and questioning um check it out go to peterpanacor.love you can find the links and the password under the programs and next week i swear to god i'm going to put it in the link um, down below which i forgot to do today yeah, I meant to. So, um, you're the luckiest person in the world to be here. You are the luckiest person in the world to be here, all of you. Yeah, primary feathers. We're the luckiest people to be here. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Your support really makes a big difference. I mean, really big difference. Keeps me out of having to go back into a pulpit again because you know ministry you don't get rich in ministry that's a well, some people do some people have jets but they're they're fleecing the sheep those jet flying fleece sheepers sheep fleecers 
Yeah, but you know, so this is this is this is this is how I'm I'm trying to make a living at the moment too, just like every other preacher. Um, so I appreciate it a lot. Your your support means a ton to me. It makes it possible for me to be here and not have to squeeze myself down into a pulpit again. God help me. Hope I don't have to do that. Uh, do Boston. Everybody wants. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you, uh, Raw. Boston accent is a mock of distinction. It's a wicked good mock of distinction. And I was proud. I was wicked proud of my Boston accent. It's just that when I was an undergraduate at UMass, after I came back from Montana, I took this class in radio theater. And my professor told me that if I didn't lose the Boston accent, if I didn't move my eyes from where they were, like, oh, dear, oh, dear, um, to if I didn't move my eyes to where they belonged, that I was going to flunk the course. I got an A, just saying, I got an A. But I did so because he began to train me with a pencil in my mouth how to speak articulately. And I, I took a lot of articulation lessons over, over many, many years, not just when I was at UMass. Uh, I ended up having a great professor from the New York Academy of Drama, drama from uh, right here in uh, New York, Academy of Drama, uh, right here in Booth Bay Harbor, who was uh, who would came and critique me on a yearly basis, once or twice a year, and uh, trained my tongue to be articulate. Anyway, I miss Jim. What a great man. Jim and Frank. She's some crow. I respect and appreciate you so much. Thanks, Margie. Love that accent. <laughs> maybe I'll, maybe, maybe I should, Rob, Rob, Rob and I were talking. Maybe I should bring back my Boston accent now that I'm not on TV no more anymore. I don't, I still never spoke in correct English. I mean, I do, I do my best to speak grammatically solid. Uh, I think the movie with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. Yeah. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. They've made a whole career out of it. I know. Maybe I should go back to Boston. My, it, every time I go back to Boston or I go to Cape Cod, see my family, I've got to put on my Boston accent again. I got to work at it because if I don't have a Boston accent when I'm on the Cape, I don't get any respect. <laughs> I just don't. They're like, oh, I don't know where you're from, but you're not from here. So uh, a few more minutes and then I got to go because I got to take a little break before we go to Mystic Tea Salon. Uh, a world famous animal communicator, a world famous animal communicator also describes reincarnation of animals and how sometimes people and pets have past lives together. Oh, that's cool. We haven't even talked about animal incarnation. I mean, the Krishnas, um, they talk about animal reincarnation. You do, you have a bad karmic round, you know, you come back as a mosquito. Well, fortunately, mosquitoes lives are pretty fast. Um, and if you're a good mosquito, if you're a good mosquito in this life, you suck a lot of blood and you raise your babies, then maybe you get to come back as a, what? A butterfly. Um, thank you, Avatar. Thank you very much. Appreciate that for the super chat. Love the accent. So funny. We don't have a West, West, you don't have, I know you don't have an accent on the West side of Massachusetts. It's such a small state. I mean. Wista, yeah, I grew up outside of Wista too, between Boston and Wista. So, so in Maine, we got a bunch of accents. Yeah, you know, we got the French Canadian accent, we've got the Down East accent, we've got the Mid Coast accent. It's, I love independent speaking, Peter. Happy to support that. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, uh, thank you, Peter. Thank everyone else who supports him. Welcome back, Peter. Happy dancing inside and out. Thanks, Wendy. My old friend and longtime friend, Wendy. Thanks a lot. That in college at UMass, Amherst, out in the Happy Valley. Um, newscasters are trained in the Midwest accent. My sister got into a special ed when we moved from New Jersey to <laughs> <laughs> Chicago. Yeah. Yes. They, we, 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 I don't have the elongation of the Midwestern accent. I, I speak a little more mid Atlantic, I think Maryland and Virginia, but TV, I definitely speak TV and 
you know, if I end up moving back to the Cape, Massachusetts, I, you know, who knows what the future holds. Maybe my accent will come back and I won't be able to control it. I'll be, I'll be wildly Boston. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Cynthia, no respect on the Cape. No respect in the Cape in Boston. It's totally true. It's totally true. All right. I got four minutes, so I got to go. Uh, I heard the same, Peter, about mosquitoes in life. Oh, ho. I was making that up as I went along, I did, uh, um, Adarsha. But I'm, you know, I was accurate. That must have maybe intuitive thinking. Thanks, brother. Mosquito to vampire reincarnation. Yeah, I noticed that about Maine. I love all the different accents. It's calling a prophet is not welcomed in his own hometown. Yeah, Jesus said that and Jesus was right again. Again, he was right. Yeah. All right, my friends, I got four minutes, four minutes to get to Mystic Tea Salon. So I'm going to say peace and thank you all for being here today. Thank you for the support and the love. Uh, subscribe, click like. Thanks for all the, su uh, the, the super chat. Uh, I can't tell you how much it means to me to have this kind of support because I know I'm, I'm risk taking um, and I'm stepping outside the box because there is no box in heaven. Peace and love, everybody. I'll leave this run for a second. Uh, you guys can chat. I'll step outside and I'll step back in. Nah, I probably shut it, shut it off first. All right, my friends. Peace and love, everybody. PETA. Yeah, my name is PETA. Just want to say that. It's not Peter. It's PETA. Love you guys. <laughs>